My name is Yugetsu, and I'm a senior student here at the Village Zendo. And uh, recently I've had some health issues that made it easier for me to do this talk um, remotely. And I'm actually, um, uh, you know, this has been observed before by speakers, you know, it's one of the positive uh, impacts of COVID has been our online Sangha and this kind of spirit with which we meet the unexpected and we go with it and we adapt and we change and the show goes on. So um, I'm grateful for that. So I'm starting to see the first falling leaves. And of course, that's a, a sure sign that fall is coming. And this lush reality of summer in this hemisphere subtly shifts and the energy starts to return back to the roots of the trees. And as the leaves fall, we've come to expect that autumn is coming. Yet at this point, any comfort or stability I might find in the concept of summer and fall are shifting in unsettling ways. The earth is warming at an alarming uh, level. And we've been told that this summer, 2023, is the hottest one on record. That, of course, is alarming enough, but there are also experts informing us that um, it's likely to be the coolest summer we'll have for the rest of our lives. And that's a startling transformation, you know, that concerns us all. And it's also in the context of what we're doing here tonight, it's a, a potent reminder that there's nothing to stand on, nothing to hold on to. If you're holding on to concepts or you're holding on to this idea of who you are, you're, you're probably anxious because there's only change ahead. Life is always changing life and life transforms life in various ways. And, you know, we've been seeing this again at an alarming rate through fires, mudslides, floods, all this change, which we may or may not accept or like or want its reality. It's what's happening right now. And it calls on us. How do we respond? This idea of impermanence and impermanence itself is so, so fundamental to our practice. But, you know, what is the statement impermanence? What does it viscerally mean? It, the concept itself can be um, just another thing that we need to drop. I find it very hard to talk about these concepts because um, for me, um, the most vital transforming uh, moments happen when I cut off these intellectual concepts and stay present with what's happening just right now, even when it's heart wrenching or challenging. So, speaking of, recently our dog, our beloved dog, Kevin, died. Now, some folks say uh, it's only a dog, but for some of us, the dog is family and their loss causes, you know, a profound sense of grief. And we had to face this when we put Kevin down. Kevin as a dog was very special to me. He was always teaching me something about life. And this is actually the second Dharma talk I've given um, about Kevin. Many years ago, I, I gave a talk called Finding Kevin um, about um, an experience I had where Kevin ran away shortly after we um, rescued him, after a, a loud noise uh, spooked him in the city. And he really, he just ran from the West Side Highway uh, to uh, Washington Square Park 
during rush hour. I mean, it was totally amazing that this dog was ever found. Um, and this talk I gave was about uh, being present and responding uh, compassionately in the moment, even when I was completely panicked and desperate. And at the time, I don't know if I said this in the talk, but I, I vowed that if I ever, ever found him again, I'd treasure him every moment. And I did for every year I had him. And, um, but of course, impermanence pops up and that clock uh, on this deep attachment started ticking faster when we learned that Kevin uh, had kidney disease and only a few months to, to live. And when it came down time to put him down, we brought him to the vet where we were ushered into the Rainbow Bridge room, a room thoughtfully set up by the vet staff to make a quiet and peaceful space where people could say goodbye to their pets. Uh, many uh, vets have noted that dogs look for their humans when they're being put down. So th they want people to be present for it and they encourage them by making a space for this to happen. Now, when we went into the Rainbow Bridge Room, there's um, a large banner with a rainbow on it. And on this rainbow are written the words of the Rainbow Bridge poem. And uh, the end of the banner is sort of draped over the, uh, the metal table in the middle of the room. Now, the Rainbow Bridge poem depicts this beautiful afterlife that pets have that they go to after they die. And in this, this idea of pet heaven, um, they, they play and they wait. And when you die, you, um, you find them on that bridge and you're reunited. So I, I have to say that I've always felt the idea of a uh, place where dead pets play awaiting your return is um, a bit corny to me and cringe as they say now. So when I walked in the room, I wouldn't look at the banner and I wouldn't read the poem, partly because I didn't wanna bring cynicism into the moment and partially because ironically, if I did read the poem, I would start weeping. So um, ultimately, I was thankful that the banner was there because the edge of it was on this cold metal table. And as Kevin was laid on one side, I could put my face on it and make eye contact with Kevin while he was administered the drugs that were ending his life. And so, um, and I had my face down there and was just telling him what a good boy he was and and the staring went on forever and ever and finally you know my my neck was starting to ache and the the banner was sticking to my face because the tears were rolling off of it and you know I I lifted my head and, and said to the vet is he dead or alive and the vet looked at me, was so kindly, I have to say, and he said to me, oh, he was dead for a while. So it, it brings this question or it brought this question up for me. Um, when was he alive? When was he dead? Was he dead all this time? I was talking to him and we were in such intense eye contact. I couldn't say, and I still can't say. And this experience brought to mind a really wonderful koan that deals with the heart of this matter. And this is a Blue Cliff Record number 55, Dao Wu's Condolence Call. So here's the first part of the case, and I'm going to break it down. Uh, the story goes on into a few parts, so I'll, I'll do it in three parts. So it begins, Dao Wu and Chen Yuan went to a house to make a condolence call at a funeral. Chen, Chen Yuan hit the coffin and said, alive or dead? Dao Wu said, I won't say alive and I won't say dead. Chen Yuan said, 
why won't you say? Dawu said, I won't say. Halfway back, as they were returning, Chen Yuan said, tell me right away, teacher. If you don't tell me, I'll hit you. Dawu said, you may hit me, but I won't say. And Chen Yuan hit him. So, the koan tells us that this is a condolence call at a funeral. They're not officiating. That, that would come later on um, from you know, what I've researched into it, the uh, Chinese and Japanese custom of Buddhist officiating came later. So this was a funeral they were just going to. Was it somebody that they knew? It doesn't say. It presents the question very directly. Wrapping on the coffin, Chen Yuan calls out, alive or dead? Who is he, who is he addressing here right now? We're not sure. It, 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 the body? His teacher picks it up though. He replies, I won't say dead. I won't say alive. He's not giving an answer. And Chen Yuan presses on, why won't you say? But Dao Wu won't say. So they, they head back to the monastery and these, this question keeps on brewing in, in Chen Yuan. It's irking him, it's under his skin. He works himself up and and, and actually directly um, almost threatens the teacher. Tell me right away or I'll hit you. Dao Wu refuses and Chen Yuan strikes him. Now, it's very strange in any of these cons that a student hits a teacher. It just doesn't happen. We don't encourage it. It's not supposed to be. It's unacceptable in our practice. However, in this case, it, it does point to that incredible frustration that can come up when you're working on a koan, especially with your teacher. You know, why won't you just tell me what's going on here? Why do you just keep tormenting me with these little clues? Why won't you say? Or why do you keep saying that? Whatever, there's these burning questions that um, that can almost cause anger. You know, why won't you tell me? You're my teacher, tell me. But the teacher faces a dilemma here because if they tell you, they're depriving you of your own intimate experience. So, you know, they're actually stepping in the way of your direct awakening. And we see that in the next part of the koan because after Dao Wu passed on, Chen Yuan went to Shishuang and brought up this very same story. The first part of the koan goes through. Shishuang listens to it and says, I won't say alive and I won't say dead. Chen Yuan says, why won't you say? Shishuan says, I won't say, I won't say. At these words, Chen Yuan has insight. Now, the koan doesn't tell you exactly what this insight is. The point is not to tell you. I don't think any koan tells you. They're all pointers. What it does give us in the final part is how Chen Yuan manifests this realization. So the last part, one day Chen Yuan took a hoe into the teaching hall and crossed back and forth from east to west, from west to east. So it's kind of, you know, absurd, you know, that anybody, can you imagine coming into the village Zendo with the shovel over my shoulder and, and walking back and forth, back and forth? So Shishuan says, what are you doing? And Chen Yuan says, I'm looking for the relics of my late master. Shishuan says, vast waves spread far and wide, 
foaming billows flood the sky. What relics of our late master are you looking for? And here there's a comment, as there often are in these koans. Sueto says, oh, heavens. Chen Yuan says, this is just where I should apply the effort. And the last line is another comment of, by Fu of Taiwan, who says, the late master's relics are still present. So Chen Yuan looks for the marrow of his beloved teacher right here, right now. He says, this is just where I should apply the effort. Right here, where every moment is a moment of birth, every moment is a moment of death. Can we be awake for it? There's a pointer on this koan that is, is really beautiful. In the very beginning, secure and intimate with the whole of reality, one obtains realization right here in contact with flow, able to turn things around, one assumes responsibility directly. Now, assuming responsibility calls for this kind of compassionate awareness, dropping our preconceptions of reality. This is what helps bring us any kind of insight into our lives. And so the Dharma wheel turns. And so I'm thinking of my mother, Rose. And I'm thinking of her because after 63 years, she finally made the decision to move into a, a senior living facility. And 10 years ago, when my father died, she said to us, the only way I'm leaving this house is in a box. The house was her identity. It held the memories of the 50 years that she lived there with my dad. And it also held the memory of her kids, my brother and I. Our rooms were still the way we left them. They were there. We didn't think she'd ever want to move. But over the years, particularly through COVID, um, as she grew more frail, the house was isolating and it was turning into her coffin. And recently she said to us, I don't want to live in this house another winter. She wanted something new, something more, to live a more engaged life in community. I see my mother's realization in this koan, letting go of concepts of who you are, concepts that may be holding you back, recognizing that these mindsets that too often define us are transitory. In contact with the flow, able to turn things around, one assumes responsibility directly. This is where the compassionate action arises. For me, assuming responsibility was letting go of my grief at saying goodbye to Kevin and opening up to much larger essence, the quality of looking into Kevin's eyes, the complete love and devotion that was Kevin. I still feel that quality in my life all the time, in contact with this flow. And it helps me appreciate my life and what's possible. Our um, sutras teach us that everything is unborn and undying. They're all manifestations of the Buddha mind. But what does that mean in this moment for any of us? 
I won't say. But I will leave you with an excerpt from a really wonderful poem by Mary Oliver titled In Blackwater Woods. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go.